Hi guys. How are you guys doing? Um, so my name is Latoya Kabusi. I go to Reading Memorial High School. Yeah. Um, I've lived in Reading since second grade, and I'm just gonna start my introduction. Can you hear me perfectly fine? Yeah. Okay. When a person has an identity crisis, they are concerned, I mean, they're confused or uncertain about who and what they are. Sometimes confused about their sexuality, race, gender, social status, class, etc. But when one has a grasp of their superficial identity, they start to ask them themselves, who am I? If I take away my external identity, who am I? As a human being living with other human beings, who am I? Who am I is an extremely dangerous question that could go two ways. That question can turn your life into an indie film where you are the main character and you go through a series of unfortunate events, but towards the end, you find yourself. Or that one question can turn your whole life into a black hole leading to a course of mental health issues. Identity crises do not discriminate. They happen to all age groups. That being said, I can only speak for myself. Me as a 16 year old black female who lives in the suburbs and goes to public school. An identity crisis for me is not knowing if I'm African or African American. Then realizing it, but allowing people to call me African American because I don't wanna be that person. That person who wants basic human rights and tells people what they want to be called. Identity crisis for me is not being able to relate to Martin Luther King Jr. even though I did six presentations on him. Identity crisis for me is being too white for the black kids and too black for the white kids. Identity crisis for me is feeling like I'm losing my childhood because I choose not to be ignorant. A big portion of me not knowing who I am is the education system that I've been in since preschool. We're all here today because we know there's a, there's a lot of flaws in the education system. And students and teachers deserve more. We need more representation, more teachers, psychologists, and guidance counselors of color and a part of the LGBT, LGBT community. We need to learn more about mental health issues and ways we can deal with it or get help. We need it to be a requirement for staff to go through how to be an anti-racist training. We need to update the history we're teaching students. We need education reform. So we, the youth, present March for Our Lives. We're going to hear teachers, students, parents, and residents speak about education reform. Our goal is to motivate you guys to take action because we, the youth, deserve more and deserve a better future. Thank you. Hi everyone. My name is Anna Cuevas. I'm a video production teacher at RMHS and RCTV Studios. Thank you. <laughs> um, I first wanna 
thank, start off by thanking We the Youth for inviting me to speak today. Um, I grew up right next door in Wakefield, so I know the struggle of being a person of color growing up in a predominantly white area. And while you shouldn't have to be up here fighting for your basic human rights, I absolutely applaud you for the work that you've done to teach this town the truth. So today I'm going to talk to you guys about the reality of the school to prison pipeline. If you don't know what the school to prison pipeline is, it's a disturbing national trend wherein children are funneled out of the public schools and into juvenile and criminal justice systems. Many of these children have many of these children have learning disabilities or histories of poverty, abuse or neglect. Instead of being given additional educational and counseling services, these students are isolated, punished, and pushed out of the schooling system. Data from the U.S. Department of Education Office for Civil Rights show that black students are much more likely to be suspended from preschool than white students. Wait a minute. Did I just say preschool? Yes, preschool. Preschoolers are getting suspended. Black students make up 18% of all preschoolers, 18% but represent 48% of all preschool suspensions. While white students make up 43% of preschoolers, yet represent 26% of those receiving suspension. So what's the deal? Well, a 2014 study by the American Psychological Association found that black boys are viewed as older and less innocent than white boys. Black boys are more likely to be mistaken as older, be perceived as guilty, and face police violence if accused of a crime, says research conducted by the APA. And it doesn't stop there. We still have K through 12. In the US, black students are suspended and expelled three times more often than white students when committing similar infractions. Black students represent 19% of students with disabilities and 36% of those with disabilities who are restrained at school. So what's the reasoning for this happening? For most students, the pipeline begins with inadequate resources in the public schools. Overcrowded classrooms, insufficient funding for counselors, special education services, and even textbooks force these students into second-rate educational environments. When teachers and administration fail to meet the educational needs of the students, it increases disengagement and dropouts, which in turn increases the risk of later court involvement. Another reason for the formation of this school to prison pipeline is because many schools across the country have embraced zero tolerance policies. These policies automatically impose severe punishment regardless of circumstances. Under these policies, Students around the country have been expelled for infractions such as bringing nail clippers or scissors to school, chewing a Pop-Tart into a gun shape, or bringing a camping fork for Boy Scouts to class. These overly harsh disciplinary policies push students down the pipeline and into the juvenile justice system. Students who are suspended or expelled are often left unsupervised and without constructive activities to further their education. They also can easily fall behind in their coursework, which leads to a greater likelihood of disengagement and dropouts. And all of these factors increase the likelihood of court involvement. Another reason why the school to prison pipeline exists is because a growing number of districts across the country employs, employ school resource officers to patrol school hallways, which places increased reliance on police rather than teachers and administrators to maintain discipline. As a result, children are far more likely than they were just a generation ago to be subject to school-based arrests, the majority of which are for non-violent offenses such as disruptive behavior. Students are literally getting arrested for being disruptive in class. Many of these students with repeat school policy offenses are thrown into something called disciplinary alternative schools. These schools, these schools are growing in numbers across the country. These schools are not required to follow educational accountability standards, such as minimum classroom hours and curriculum requirements. And in turn, these schools may fail to provide meaningful educational services to the students who need them the most. 
When struggling students return to their regular school from the alternative school, they are unprepared and permanently stuck in an inferior educational setting. That or they're funneled through alternative schools and into the juvenile justice system. Kids who become involved in the juvenile justice system are often denied procedural protections in the courts. Students who commit minor offenses may end up in secure detention if they violate probation conditions such as missing school or disobeying teachers. Students pushed along the pipeline find themselves in juvenile detention facilities, many of which provide few, if any, educational services. Students of color who are far more likely than their white peers to be suspended, expelled, or arrested for the same kind of conduct at school, and those with disabilities are particularly likely to travel down the school to prison pipeline. And once you're, set de once you're sent down this pipeline, it's difficult to return. Students who enter the juvenile justice system face many barriers to their re-entry into traditional schools. The vast majority of these students never graduate from high school. This is racism at its finest. And I know what you're all thinking right now. Oh, that's so horrible. It's a good thing we live in Massachusetts. We have the best school system in the country. That would never happen here. Well, I hate to break it to you, but it happens all around the country and it definitely happens in Massachusetts. Black students in Massachusetts schools are almost four times more likely than white peers to be suspended from school, which is more than the national average, by the way. And Latino students are three times more likely than white students to be suspended, often for minor offenses. Children with disabilities make up 20% of Boston public students, but they account for 47% of suspensions and expulsions. That means that schools are responding to children with disabilities, children who are disproportionately Latino and black, punitively instead of therapeutically. Students of color are more likely to be disciplined for subjective offenses, such as defiance, disrespect, or dress code violations, whereas white students are often, uh, are more likely to be disciplined for provable, documentable offenses, like alcohol possession, smoking, and vandalism. In Massachusetts during the 2012-2013 school year, which was when I was in high school, Black students received 43% of all out-of-school suspensions and 39% of, of expulsions, despite making up less than 9% of students enrolled. That's in Massachusetts, folks. That's here in our state. The statewide average for the number of days of instruction missed due to school discipline in Massachusetts is 16 days for every 100 students enrolled. This number doubles to 32 days for students with disabilities, and for black students, the number is 34 days, more than triple the amount missed by white students. An ACLU report of school po policing in Massachusetts' three largest school districts, Boston, Springfield, and Worcester, which are all predominantly low-income districts with majority students of color, found numerous arrests at school during the school day based on misbehavior that could have been addressed more appropriately by teachers and school staff and with significantly less harm to students. The report found that in Springfield, most public order arrests involve youth who refuse to obey directives in a verbally confrontational manner. This means students, children, who may have swore or exhibited disrespectful behavior towards teachers, police officers, or other adults were arrested. They were charged with crimes such as disorderly conduct, disturbing a lawful assembly, or violating codes of conduct. School discipline and educational disparities reflect the reality of our criminal justice system. Only 7% of Massachusetts residents are black, yet 28% of people behind bars in Massachusetts are black. Changes need to be made for our students, and in particular, our students of color who suffer from the school to prison pipeline the most. And it must come from the top. And honestly, right now, I'm looking around and I'm very disappointed in the fact that I do not see anybody from the administration here at all. For anybody, any in the Reading Public School, no one is here, no one is here. And I'm addressing you if you are watching this video. I'm addressing you right now. Uh, so I, I should not have to be up here telling the leaders of this town to make changes. I'm 24 years old. I should be up doing whatever 24 year olds do. 
and it's absolutely ridiculous that these kids are fighting for the exact same thing that I was fighting for when I was in high school. These students who found We the Youth are doing a great job, but they should not have to be up here to fight for their humanity and to beg the adults in this town to take their legitimate concerns seriously. They are children. They should be enjoying their teen years. Things need to change drastically. And I'm speaking again to the leaders of this town and the leaders of Reading Public Schools when I say, the ball is in your court and it has been for quite some time. You need to make changes and you need to make them now. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Evelyn Howell. I'm a junior at Reading Memorial High School, and I have lived in Reading my entire life. And for a really long time, I didn't really know what racism was. I knew it was bad and that everyone should be treated equally regardless of skin color, but that was about it. In school, I was taught that racism ended after schools became desegregated, and I thought Christopher Columbus was a hero, and I thought the first settlers were best friends with the natives. I never even noticed how white our town was till about middle school, because growing up, I never had to give my race a second thought. I may not have been racist, but I couldn't even recognize racism when I saw it, and I was never taught to. I had to learn about lynchings, redlining, mass incarceration, all on my own. I was lucky enough to have parents that cared about civil rights and encouraged me to learn about and speak about injustice, but for many that is absolutely not the case. Over the last few months, I've had a lot of conversations with peers regarding race, and I've heard several times that they believe racism doesn't exist in this country. We cannot leave it up to the individual to learn about the oppression of black people and people of color in this country. It needs to be a part of the curriculum in public schools. And while we live in a country that prides itself on diversity, with people of color making up 23.7% of the population, we have never had an education system that reflected that. Because racism isn't just a blip in American history, it is the part of the f part foundation our country was built on, and we have ignored it for too long. In 1860, enslaved people represented 45% of the total wealth in the South. Our flourishing economy was a direct result of the exploitation of black people. Redlining is the, one of the clearest examples of institutionalized racism in America that still affects people today, yet not once have I heard it mentioned in a classroom setting. Schools in the South still teach that states' rights and, rights and sectionalism were the main causes of the Civil War and not slavery. And if one did want to learn about these things, they would have to take an elective that only some schools offer or do their own research. There shouldn't need to be an interest and a topic like this to learn about it. It should be mandatory. How can we expect to get rid of racism in this country if we refuse to deny its existence? We can't. President Trump recently announced a patriotic education commission to develop a pro-education, pro-American curriculum and to promote patriotic education. This was in response for a push to schools to include history that better acknowledges slavery and systematic racism. We need to be taught history in its entirety, not just the parts that we think make America look good. It's easy to think something doesn't exist because it doesn't happen to you. And it's easy to believe what we learned in school. And it's easy to believe America has no problems with racism. But I don't think it's un-American to recognize our country's flaws and want to improve on them. In fact, I think it's the opposite. We need radical change in the way our country and school system addresses and teaches rest systematic racism, and we need it now. Thank you. Hi, I'm Margaret. I'm a senior at Reading Memorial High School. Um, the other night, I was talking with my dad about how shocked I was that one of my classmates did not know the name of Ruby Bridges, one of the first black children to attend an all-white school in America. To my surprise, my dad told me he didn't necessarily know a lot about who she was either. 
he asked my brother and me why we knew so much about her, and we replied frankly that she was one of the maybe three black people we learned about in elementary school, the other two being Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King Jr. My dad, who lived through the civil rights era, then began to list off names of a lot of important black figures from the civil rights era that my brother and I had never heard of, and tell us all about the Black Panther Party and a lot of important historical events of the time. I knew a limited amount of this information as I had learned briefly about some of it and what he was talking about a few months ago in my junior year of high school. While I was glad to be more educated on American history, I was also upset. Why hadn't anyone told me this sooner? I know that schools can't teach you everything you need to know or every fact in the world, and we need to hold ourselves accountable for being educated people and citizens, but a lack of diverse curriculum and representative education has always been a problem in the Reading school system. Even in elementary school, I remember learning the names of more white men than I can recall, but only learning about Ruby Bridges, Rosa Parks, and MLK as the important non-white people, which also the only important non-white people we're learning about be all being black isn't very representative of America either. As I got older, I realized how little I know about the things that really matter, and I've gone out of my way to educate myself a lot about human rights, social justice, and political issues, and realized that I have a strong passion for human rights advocacy. And while that's all good for me and stuff, I had to choose elective, what am I saying? Oh, I feel like a lot of what I've learned about the true diverse history of a country, I had to seek out myself, meaning that those who don't care as much as I do or might just not know, don't seek out this important education and therefore never learn enough about America's true history or expand their viewpoints culturally. I had to elect to choose a class on diverse voices, AP government, and facing history. And even in the few short months I've been in these classes, I've learned so much and have become a more critical thinker and more exposed to a more diverse and accurate representation of our country. Being educated on history and social issues outside our personal bubbles in a predominantly white town with an education system focused on white viewpoints shouldn't be a choice, of, a choice that students actively have to seek out, but a requirement. I recall in my freshman year English class reading To Kill a Mockingbird, which is a white savior novel, and worse than that, our teacher encouraged us to use the N-word, and she used it herself in what she called a historical context. I've heard of teachers at the school who have debates over whether or not the N-word is okay in the sake of reading a book. Note that these conversations happen in predominantly, if not entirely, white classrooms. That is not okay. By opening up the use of this word for debate and encouraging students to say it, even just a specific context, teachers take away the power of a word which is so deeply hurtful and racist that no white person should be saying it at all. If students think it's okay to use a word in a classroom and think it's something to have a valid opinion or argument about, this leads to a slippery slope of thinking, well, if it's okay to say in a book, why can't I sing it in a song? And the idea that there is an appropriate context for them as a white person to be using the N-word, when in fact there is not. Reading schools do not offer a diverse curriculum or one that is realistic or representative of the world that we live in. While this isn't the sole source of ignorance among people in Reading, I think it's a huge contributing factor, and it's really upsetting to not see enough diversity in our curriculum. Hi, hey everybody. My name is Jess Bailey. I'm a social studies teacher at RMHS. Let's give a huge round of applause to the speaker so far, especially to the students. It is so intimidating to stand up here and talk. Amazing job, everybody. I'm really honored to be here. Um, thank you, We the Youth, for asking me to speak today. Um, there's so much that I could talk about. I could talk about education policy, access to anti-racist curriculum, anti-bias training for teachers and administrators, reassessing our discipline procedures, and so on. But the people that have spoken already and the ones that are gonna come after me have spoken really beautifully about those things, so I'm gonna leave it to them. And instead, I'm gonna to talk today about the day that I realized that I was racist. Even just saying that phrase makes me cringe. I mean, I don't wanna be racist. No halfway decent person does. That's the bare minimum. At the time I had this realization, I was already a few years into teaching, and I thought with all my heart that I wasn't racist. I believed that I was one of the good ones. I mean, I'd been through a lot of diversity and equity workshops. I'd even been trained in my, excuse me, my previous career to be a racial justice facilitator. It had been my job to help businesses and their employees have hard conversations about race. So obviously I couldn't be a racist. So when it happened, the realization tore me up inside. This story isn't something I'm proud of, and obviously it wasn't intentional, but so many of our microaggressions are, 
And that fact doesn't exclude them and excuse them. This incident, this act of racism, stemmed from carelessness, from being lazy. This was a few years ago. It was probably around the end of September, a few weeks into the school year. I'm bad at learning student names. There are just so many of them. And so to help me learn all of my students' names, I would learn little shortcuts about them. Maybe I remember that Becca was the redhead with glasses, or Nate was very tall and blonde, or Mark always wore a Red Sox hat and Lexi always had an iced coffee in A block. You all see where this is going. And don't get me wrong, I've mixed up my fair share of white students too. One year I had four Olivias in one class and I could not keep Maddie and Megan straight last year to save my life. But those mix-ups, while insensitive on my part, weren't racist. What was racist was that several years ago, I had two female black students out of 125. And on more than one occasion in the first month of school, I'd call them by each other's names. What was racist was that the shortcut I used was remembering them by their skin color. Whether consciously or unconsciously, I had reduced them to their race. And that's pretty much the definition of racism. Every time the wrong name would come out of my mouth, I would immediately know that I was being racist. I knew it was wrong by not being able to distinguish between these two students. I was denying their own unique identities, and they were nothing alike. They had different personalities. They were in different activities. They didn't dress the same. They didn't even have the same fashion sense. They didn't look alike at all, except that they were black. This happened a handful of times to both girls in my classes. They weren't in the same period, and the last time it happened, I knew I needed to address it. I had to own up to it. But in doing so, I performed another microaggression. During small group work time, I went over to the student and I told her I was sorry for mixing up her name, that I knew what I had done was racist and I was gonna try harder. And at the time, I felt so proud of myself for owning up to my problematic behavior. But I made this apology not just to the student, I made it in front of her peers, too. I know that some of them heard me, and to be honest, that may have been a subconscious motive for white students to see what a good person I was, learning from my mistakes. But in doing so, I essentially put her in the position of having to accept my apology and tell me that it was okay, there was no problem, which she did. And she told me that it happened all the time, as if that made it any better. But it wasn't. Essentially, I had turned the situation around. Instead of me assuring her that I saw her as an individual and valued her presence in the class, I made her have to be the caretaker of my emotional state and to receive my wokeness, assuring me that I was still a good person. So why do I tell you this story? There are a couple reasons. First, I want my fellow white educators to know that being better, being anti-racist, is a lifelong learning process. American historian and anti-racist author and advocate Ibram X. Kendi says that a person can be both racist and anti-racist at the same time. And I believe that's where I am in my journey of unlearning white privilege and dismantling racism. But secondly, and perhaps more importantly, it's not enough for us to talk about what needs to change within the system. We have to also, and perhaps first, look to what needs to change about ourselves. We're all gonna make mistakes, and it's important to own up to them. And we have to be really deliberate and thoughtful in how we do so. We need to see our black and brown students as individuals, the same way that we easily see our white students. We need to get in touch with our own implicit biases, talk about them openly, and it's up to us to figure out how to address them. Can't ask the students to do it for us. Finally, while this story has been about me and my actions, as white educators, we need to remember that this, isn't, this work isn't about us and our own egos. It can be really hard to hear the feedback from our black and indigenous and people of color students and our colleagues sometimes. We have to get over that. Whenever I give a speech, I like to try to end with a great closing line. And I have to be honest with you, I struggled with this one, trying to find a way to bring it all together and end the speech in some cohesive sort of way. So instead, I'll just close with this. I am so proud of my students, but I'm especially proud of the students that are in We The Youth because they are doing hard work that, like Anna said, they shouldn't have to do. 
I'm so proud of the fact that you are standing up for yourselves and trying so hard to make writing a better place. You are inspiring inspiring to me as a teacher and to so many of the other educators and adults that are here, and you are wise beyond your years. It is an absolute honor to be in your presence. I'm excited to continue this work with you, and I hope that I can continue learning from my past mistakes, as well as from the work that you do too. Thank you, everybody. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, first and foremost, um, some of you may recognize me and some of you may not, so I just want, in terms of clarity, um, I am actually not a Reading Public School teacher. Um, I am a teacher. I um, have taught for eight to nine years. I'm not only in Boston Public Schools, but also Somerville and currently in Cambridge. Um, I am a resident here in Reading, Massachusetts. Um, I've been here for about two, maybe two and a half years. Um, and um, over the last several months, um, I've been honored um, to be asked by the incredible um, leaders, um, young people um, from Reading Public Schools to take part in many of the initiatives and efforts and programming and events centered on their agency. Um, so any time that I am asked to take part in any way to support all of our students um, within this state. Um, I don't take it for granted. Um, so truly to the organizers of today's event, thank you so much for in many ways adopting me. Um, and again, I, I take comfort in the fact that I um, can be remotely supportive in what you try to do each and every single day um, and also learn from you just as any adult um, is as well. So thank you. <clears throat> now the fun part. Um, <clears throat> My name is Kevin Dua. I am he, him, and his. And as a black educator, it is important to recognize the space that we're all in. So just like any good teacher, we usually start a lesson with a hook, a do now, something to engage or to captivate everyone before the lesson or presentation takes place. So let's try this activity. And don't worry, you're not gonna be graded, it's totally fine. If you are a student, within the Reading Public Schools system, please raise your hand. Keep your hand up, okay? Again, let me repeat this. If you are a student in Reading Public Schools, if you are able to, please extend your arm as high as you can. Okay. If you are a teacher, a staff member of Reading Public Schools, or even an adult of Reading Public Schools, just keep your hand or your arms down. Cool. The next part of this is, for any student that's raising their hand, I want you to take about a few seconds in your head. I don't want you to say any names, but I want you to take a few seconds in your head with this question. If you can think of at least one teacher within your life as a Reading Public School student, whether it's in the past or currently, that you believe was racist, that hurt yourself and all other students, and you felt that they should not be able to continue harming individuals, whether it's yourself or your classmates, because of their racism and discrimination, keep your hand up. Keep your hand up if you can currently think of at least one teacher. Keep your hand up. You are an adult. It's 
staff member of Reading Public Schools, look at all the students who have their hands up. Hands down. I will say this comfortably. I know it is easier said than done for me to use that type of do now activity within a district that I'm, that I'm not a part of. And if I was a betting person, I would not be surprised if there's at least one adult teacher here that would say, who in the hell does this man think he is? Making my heart race just a little bit. And I'm also here to say that I have done this in my own workplace. And I've gotten the same reactions from other educators who knew that students were transparent and telling the truth about their harm. About their harm and what they felt that they needed and wanted in an explicit way. So I say all of that to lay the context of this. The only thing worse than being alone is wishing you were. I hope we all know that it was a white man, an adult, who was appointed to be the lone leader to help lead other adults as himself, to aspire and take what they felt they were entitled to because of their belief that their race, class, gender, and age were what was white above others, from the Sioux to the Cherokee indigenous people of all ages of whom land we walk, live, and march on today. 44 adult men later, and we are all less than 10 days away where another adult will be appointed by millions of other adults to lead us. Millions upon millions have already, and millions upon millions will wait in line maybe for a few minutes, maybe for several hours due to voter suppression. And they're gonna cast a vote between one or two individuals who spent literal minutes, maybe four to five minutes, actually debating about kids, children, and youth, your ages, who are literally in cages right now, who have been separated from their parents, who are traumatized for life. And one of these two individuals who are going to lead this country about 10 days from now, debated humanity for about four to five minutes. We live in a society that was accustomed to all adult men are created equal. We live in a society that is accustomed to having adults like myself, or my age I should say, decide and enact wars, genocide, violence, and discriminatory laws that dehumanize humans. And as adults, we turn to the young people and with a straight face, we tell you all each and every single day, be like us adults or be better than us or don't be like us. And all of these confusing messages stem down to this. We forget as adults, as teachers, whether we're in this district or not, we often forget that we're young, that we were young, that we all have learned fundamentals about love, support, thinking, that we forget that when human beings are born, they're not born as a 60, 70 year old dictator. They're not born as politicians or people who are adults who are racist and discriminatory. They are nurtured that way. They are cultivated that way. And that's important because 
As young people, you're not the teachers. As young people, you're not the president. You're not the law enforcement. You're not the dictators. We are the ones as adults who have this power to not do that harm to you. And I don't share anything that's new that any of us haven't heard before. Because as I said, the only thing worse than being or even feeling like you're alone with your thoughts is wishing you were. Children and kids and the teenagers that are here feel this each day and say this. They organize and plan and speak and hope and fight and dream and love to be validated as forever young with their dream to support what they want and need. And they grow up to either hold onto that or change into an image that their younger selves wouldn't recognize. This is true because any adult can tell you this. So I leave you all with this. Before I came, or before I came to this microphone, I asked some of the incredible leaders explicitly, what do you want me to say? Why is this event happening? And the response I got was, we want unfiltered history. We want unfilteredness that helps us feel that we are seen and validated. We want to look at an adult in person or virtually and know that we are being validated, we're supported, that there isn't a barrier that protects them being uncomfortable. Because with that happens, doubt, curiosity, questions, nervousness happens for us as young people. Can I trust that person? How do I know this? So I say this as explicitly as possible. History, history is written and told and remembered by anyone. And it shall be again on election day and the day after. I know for myself, 10 days from now, whether I'm waiting for a few minutes or hours, I'm going to explicitly vote for Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. And I know myself as an adult 10 years ago, if a student would have asked me, I would have said, yeah, I'm voting. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna exercise my right. Knowing that that student is looking back at me saying, I don't know if this person is voting or advocating for me behind the, behind the booth. And that explicitness is so needed. That explicitness is so needed simply because you need that transparency. I can't say black lives matter, but then I'm homophobic. I can't say black lives matter unless it's a dark skinned person. It's that intersectionality, it's that explicitness, it's that intentionality that is so important for all of us as adults since as young people, that's what you're telling us, that's what you want. So for as an adult, if you are here, I'll say to you what a young person said to me early on within my life. Vote and advocate for all the present and future children. And I can personalize this. Vote and advocate for all the present and future of children of Reading, for the past indigenous children of this once land of theirs. Vote and advocate for the children taken by a virus and by another human's hatred. Vote and advocate for the present and the future of the children at the border in cages. Vote and advocate for children in Nigeria. To do all of that and more will be useful and youthful for everyone not to ever feel, be, and or wish that they were alone on this planet. Because your youth humanity should never be up for debate, should never be vague. And that's something that can still be taught and learned regardless of your age. Thank you. How's everybody today? Good. Good. Um, I love that phrase, unfiltered um, history. I'm going to keep
keep thinking about that. Um, I want to thank uh, the organizers for asking me to speak. Um, my name is Nancy Howell, and I've lived here in Reading for 20 years. Before uh, I moved here, I lived in Somerville and worked for an anti-poverty agency. While at that agency, I taught young children of many skin tones and cultural backgrounds. I worked hard to create and teach a thoughtful, anti-bias, multicultural curriculum. For my entire adult life, I have worked with children and families from diverse backgrounds. I read books about other cultures and about inequities in our society. I thought I understood racism and prejudice. I thought I understood, but I didn't. Throughout my education up to grade 12, I don't remember ever learning about the slave trade, slavery, the civil rights movement, or about any notable black figures in history. I was, it wasn't until college that I learned about white privilege in an elective class. After George Floyd was killed, my daughter Evelyn asked me if we could put up a Black Lives Matter sign in front of our house. I thought about it and said, all lives matter. Yes, for a bit I was an all lives matter person. I thought I understood because of the books I read and my work experience and all the workshops and things that had gone, I'd gone to. Um, and I didn't, you know, I didn't want to upset the neighbors, you know? And I'm a, I'm a little ashamed to say that, you know? Um, but once I sat down with my daughter she explained to me that what Black Lives Matter really meant. It wasn't that other lives didn't matter. It was that black people's lives have been devalued in America for centuries. It was about time that we recognize the bare minimum that black lives matter. Evelyn taught me so much that I'd never understood before, even though I thought I did. But one of the most important things that this movement has taught me is that I can't remain complacent in what I've learned. Change doesn't happen overnight. As an individual, or as a society, or school curriculum, it takes sustained action and a commitment to growing my understanding of injustice in our country. Being anti-racist takes a lifetime of educating myself listening to people of color and confronting my own privilege. Thanks. Yo, yo, yo. Oh, there we go. All right, how y'all doing? Uh, I'm Grant Hightower. I am the MECO director. Been in Reading for, this is going on my second year. Spoke a couple of times to some of y'all folks who you might have heard me before. Um, Want to show much love, much, much love to we the youth. Um, I'm gonna get into it a little bit in here, but I just wanna give my undying gratitude um, and heart to you guys because it does begin with y'all. All right. I'll perform. Fighting me. <clears throat> the future belongs to those who are brave enough to shape it. In the past, this sentiment has been reserved for people who believe the future was best shaped in a way that was self-serving, tipping the balance of justice and economics in a way that alienated the masses and benefited the elite. And still, in each generation, there stood but a handful of people who found the courage and will to stand against a current of seemingly insurmountable power, influence, and resources to carve out a small piece of societal change, to remind society of its most important values and virtues. This gathering, and your participation in it is no small step. It is a stone cast in the pond of change. So stand back and really ask yourself, how many times has this happened in your lifetime as a resident of Reading? How many students, young people from the ages of 13 and 19 have created this kind of action? In my 14 months here, I've witnessed marches, art gatherings, and protests. 
I've watched you kids reach out and organize adults and access your community in ways that nonprofit or organizations have not been successful in doing. The energy you've created has reached a larger community, and whether those people are supporters or in conflict with your mission, you're headed in the right direction because you have begun to carve out your piece in the mosaic of the future. The fear of saying the wrong thing must never outweigh the injustice you're trying to fight. I will never tell you this endeavor is an easy one, to show up and knowingly step into a ring that harbors an ideology that is designed to not only defeat you, but possibly rob you of your life and liberty is terrorizing. And still you owe it to those groups of people who fought before you, and you owe it to the group of bright-eyed innocents behind you who follow. For those of you who act in the role of allies or co-conspirators, the prospect of alienation and castigation by your family or community are no excuse. If what is on the line is humanity. As a black man, I come to these communities willingly for two reasons. One, the black and brown students who come to school in these communities need that love and representation. And two, my influence on white students must lead to a change in their understanding of people who look like me. Not because there is something inherently wrong with people of color, but the avenues in accessing and understanding who we are, who we've been, and who we can be is corrupt. It is important that I'm not a spokesman, but a human. A human with a certain experience in the skin that I've been blessed to adorn. And in that experience, I've come to understand that I must stand in the middle of the arena, ground shaking, heart pumping, stomach turning, crowd hissing and jeering, and show them my humanity. Because too many others have done it so I could be here. And too many are coming behind me who can do so much more than I ever have. And this is where you all stand. Not at an impasse, but rather a breakthrough. The disorganization, fear, paralysis, and failings of adults have provided you an opportunity. You, the youth, are the single most influential group in America. You are connected in ways generations before you never have been, and you have access to information that has never been available. Your power to sway corporations, organizations, and politicians is only matched by the top 1% of the American aristocracy, who in many ways take cues from you in regard to behavior, excuse me, yeah, take cues from trends in your behavior and interests. The eyes of society are on you at all times, and this should be no news to you. So much revolves around the gatekeeping on your behavior and interests. But the bottom line is, the only thing standing in the way of you realizing the change you've been rallying for is courage. The courage to do more than post or engage online, but in person. The courage to go to your local politician or school committee member, principal or police chief, and ask curious questions on why things remain the way that they have for so long to write your newspaper or rally your neighbors and challenge the status quo, to run, for to run for office or even more radical, create a movement that challenges anything ever done before, because in your own experience, you believe there's a better way to support humanity. So there is no time to wait, for time is and will always only be kind to the young. So challenge, love, resist, create. The future is yours if you're brave enough to shape it. Love for y'all.